This morning we end a series that we've been in about the last days. We've talked about a lot of things. The first message we did an overview of some of the elements that would be involved in the last days prior to Jesus coming. We mentioned that there would be a global empire, sort of a revived Roman empire, you might say. And we we looked at current events and we saw how that is true, that the Roman empire has sort of existed in a dormant form for uh, hundreds of years. And that's actually happened again. The world is looking for a singular global leader, the Antichrist. We're looking to unify our religious systems for harmony and for peace sake. We've seen an amazing thing with the resurgence of the nation of Israel. The people, the Jews, have come back to a homeland, which is an amazing thing in our message about the fig tree, Israel being reborn as a nation. These are all elements of the last days. We've also spoken about the coming judgment, the great tribulation. And yet sometimes when you say the word last days, I mean, what do you think of when somebody says the last days? What comes to mind? Maybe a wild-eyed prophet standing out on the street corner with a sandwich board over him, shouting out the very words that are printed on that placard, the end is near, pointing his finger heavenward. Is that what you think of? Well, let me say the end is not near. The beginning is near. The beginning is near. I think it was Churchill that said, it's not the end and it's not the beginning of the end, but it very well may be the end of the beginning. And if you were with us last week and you looked at that judgment of God that he pours out on the earth, it's such a time that the earth has never known such catastrophes and desolation like it will know in the future. And if you're not uh, escaping, you have to be enduring. And then the beginning will come. The beginning of the millennium. Jesus says the end will come. And that is true. This order will end. But the beginning of a new and beautiful age, the day of the Lord, as the Bible puts it. And we read about the day of the Lord, and you might understand that as being the millennium. Of course, Moses says that a day to the Lord is like a thousand years. Peter says that as well in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8. And so the day of the Lord is a thousand years, but it begins with a spectacular sunrise. The great tribulation of God's wrath. But then the earth is cleansed. And we enter into this amazing kingdom age, the millennium. Mille, thousand. Annum means years. A thousand year reign of Christ. It's when Jesus returns and he rules on the earth. He he basically shows the world how to do it. You know, we have been trying to run this planet with our own governments and our own systems for many, many years. We've sought peace, but we've only ended up with pieces. We've broken this earth into a million pieces. The world is scarred with our wars, but the Bible says in three different places, they will beat their swords into plowshares and they will learn war no more. And that will be when Jesus comes. It's been the hope of the Jews since the Old Testament. They were looking forward to all the promises of God being fulfilled. Now, if you look at the Old Testament, it's chock full of promises. And most of them have gone unfulfilled until now. They were made to the people of Israel. But Israel missed out on some of those blessings because they failed to recognize Jesus at his first coming. And yet when they do recognize him at his second coming, he will establish his kingdom on the earth. And so in the Old Testament, the prophets, the seers, the priests, the kings... David, Abraham, Moses, they were all looking forward to that time when the Savior would come. The whole book of Genesis is full of promises about somebody who would come and and he would crush the works of Satan. We have been condemned by sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And so in the very beginning in Genesis, God promised to Adam and Eve that one would come a champion, a hero, the seed of the woman. And this one person would crush the head of the serpent, the devil, forever. He would put an end to sin. He would wash away. He would he would basically restore the earth, which had fallen and has fallen under a curse. You know, we live in a cursed world. Every morning when you wake up and you feel the creaking of your bones, you know that this life is not eternal. But Jesus said, he who lives and believes in me, even if he dies, will live again. And so we have eternal life in Jesus. He's the promised one. And when he comes back, he will restore the kingdom on the earth for a thousand years. 
And there are promises in the Old Testament, for example, the curse being lifted. The Bible says that the whole world is under a curse. And yet the whole of creation is waiting for the restoration of you and I. It says over in Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 22, I will read it for you. We'll be skipping around some verses and I will direct you to the ones that will be long enough to turn there. But if you want to jot down Romans chapter 8, verse 19, it says, For the earnest expectation of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God, you and I, the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, that is death. Not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it. God in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from its present bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. When Jesus Christ returns with His church, we will be with Him in our resurrected bodies and He will restore the earth as it once was before the flood and before the fall. Nature itself will be restored. Look over at Isaiah chapter 11. These are some of the promises that God gives about this special time. It says there in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, There shall come forth a rod, a branch from the stem of Jesse. That is the line of David that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. It's the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. And he won't judge by the sight of his eyes nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the poor. And that's our Lord. And he'll decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He will strike the earth With the rod of his mouth, now it speaks of his reign, his rule. The Bible says over in Psalm chapter 2 that he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. That promise of Jesus ruling on the earth. And it says with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. We read about that in Thessalonians, don't we? Where the Bible says that when Jesus Christ returns, he will destroy the Antichrist with the breath of his mouth or with the words that come right out of his mouth. It says righteousness will be the belt of his loins and faithfulness the belt of his waist. And so he'll establish a government that is righteous. Isaiah tells us earlier in chapter 9 of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And so a beautiful, unlimited government. I'm not a big fan of the government now, but when Jesus Christ comes back, I'm all for it. Unlimited, go for it of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And so it says there that his righteousness will rule. It says in verse 6, the wolf shall also dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. The child shall lead them. And so in that period of time, the animals will be our babysitters if you have children. Could you imagine? Honey, the tiger is here to watch the kids and the child will lead them. It says in verse 7, the cow and the bear shall graze. In other words, the animals will be vegetarians. Their young ones shall lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. Why? Because they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so the children in that time will play with rattlesnakes. I think that's probably why God made rattlesnakes for the babies as little rattles. I don't know, but it's going to be an amazing time. This is going to be a time where not only is the curse lifted to a large extent, but also nature will be restored. The promises that were made to Abraham will be fulfilled. Remember when God made that covenant with Abraham, he says, I'm going to, he does a number of things. He says, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to make you a blessing to the whole world. And of course, he was a blessing in that the Messiah came out of his family, out of the Jews. And so he was a blessing to the whole world. But then it also says that God promised that he would make his name great and that he would give him a piece of land. The piece of land that God promised to Abraham was never inherited by Abraham. It was a land from the Nile River 
in Egypt all the way to the Euphrates, which is in current day Iraq. The plot of land that God promised Abraham was as big as, well, if Abraham possessed it now, it would be part of Egypt, part of Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. They've never possessed that land, Abraham, nor any of his children, for that matter. They possessed large chunks at the peak of the dynasty during Solomon's reign, but not even close to that. And as a matter of fact, God was so clear that he was going to do this apart from anything Abraham did. Remember when Abraham made that covenant, God said, I want you to cut animals and lay them side by side. And what they would do in that case where two men entering into a covenant would walk between these animals that had been cut open. And so Abraham must have been very excited. I'm going to walk with God through this this covenant making process. But God didn't allow it. God did the same thing to Abraham that he did to Adam. When he brought Adam a wife, he put him to sleep. And Abraham passed out on the side. And the Bible says, God walked through those animals by himself as if to say, I'm going to do this for you, Abraham, without your being involved whatsoever. And so it was a promise that was made in time for all time. That is, God is going to give Abraham and his seed that land. And so that's going to be the case then. From the Nile to the Euphrates. God's rule also will be exalted. It says Jesus Christ will come down and Mount Zion will be exalted. There's this picture. We just read about it in Isaiah chapter 11. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. A mountain is a picture of a government or authority. Remember in Daniel's uh, interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He said that rock came down and it smashed the feet and it grew up into a great what? a great mountain. It spoke of the rule and the authority of God himself. Actually, in Isaiah chapter 2, it says it will come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of all the mountains. It will be established or exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people will come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And so the Bible says there also in Habakkuk chapter 1 or chapter 2 verse 14 that the knowledge of God will fill the earth. Jesus Christ comes back to this earth that is made desolate because of the abomination of man's idolatry and the world is going to be a paradise. Now this is what the Jehovah's Witnesses say, don't they? Have you ever been at home when the Jehovah's Witnesses come to the door? How many of you? There's a lot. They don't come to my house anymore. I don't know why. It's funny because whenever they come, I don't know why it is, but I don't have a shirt on. It's the weirdest thing. But I do go out and I very aggressively say, you're false teaching. And what they usually do is they hand you this pamphlet that says, look at this lion. There's a picture of, look at the beautiful paradise that's going to come if you're part of the 144,000. And they've got this weird, perverted view of Scripture. And yet there are many weird ideas about the last days. And what they do is they take the real thing, which is this beautiful age, this beautiful time of Jesus Christ ruling, and they pervert it because this because the devil is full of counterfeits. He's been counterfeiting the truth since day one. And so we have in the world this idea of, well, what does the world say? An age of Aquarius or an age of enlightenment or a golden age when the world will be beautiful and it'll all be done in the world's opinion by the strength of man. As a matter of fact, Hitler wanted to make Berlin what he called a quote unquote millennial kingdom. He had a perverted idea of the kingdom of God because sitting on the throne was not Jesus Christ, the son of God, but man. And that's what man wants to do. Man has always tried to build his own kingdom. But the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord because the Lord will do the teaching. It says the same thing in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 34, that the Lord will do the teaching. Nobody will say to to one another, hey, come on, let's go know the Lord. Because the Bible says there in Jeremiah 31, everybody will know the Lord already. I will be out of a job. I can't open the scripture and say, well, let's read and see what it says, because Jesus Christ himself will be doing it. And I'll be happy to sit and listen. And so the world will be renewed. It will be restored. Nature will be changed. And this will be a time of unprecedented blessing that was expected by the Jews in the Old Testament. It was actually expected by the disciples, wasn't it? 
Jesus was ministering among the people and all the Jews were expecting him to become the king. But he didn't come to be a king the first time. He came to be a servant. And so the disciples begged for that second place in the kingdom. Remember, one of the mothers came to Jesus and said, hey, can my boy sit on your right hand and your left hand? And the rest of the disciples were upset because they wanted to sit in that place of prestige and prominence. And so they hoped that Jesus would establish this dominant kingdom on the earth at that time. Even after Jesus was resurrected from the dead, it says that he appeared to his disciples for 40 days. Turn over to Acts chapter 1. They were still hoping for this beautiful time of God's rule and authority where sin was put down, where Satan was bound, and where Jesus Christ alone ruled. It says in verse 3 that Jesus appeared, He presented Himself after His suffering with many invaluable proofs. He was being seen by then during 40 days and He was speaking to them concerning the kingdom of God. Now, as he went on to the Mount of Olives and they were standing there waiting, Jesus told them they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit and they were still expecting for something to happen. And they asked him in verse 6, they said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They were still hoping for this Old Testament promise to be fulfilled. And of course, Jesus answered and he said, it's not for you to know the time. Don't worry about the timing. You just be my witnesses in the world. And so the early church stood with the posture of these disciples as they looked at Jesus going into heaven. Notice verse 11, verse 10 rather, while he ascended, it says they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up. And behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. And they said to the men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? I think that's a good posture to take. And that's the posture of the church ever since. Standing on the earth for truth and looking up into heaven in hopes of that kingdom coming. And so the church has had this posture from this time in the book of Acts. Standing fast on earth, but looking for Jesus Christ to come back and establish that kingdom. That's why it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, that we have turned from idols to serve the true and living God and... Wait for his son from heaven. It's the predominant theme in the whole New Testament. Not only did the Old Testament believers look forward to that thousand year reign and kingdom of Jesus Christ or the Messiah, the New Testament did as well. 318 times in the New Testament, there's a looking for the Messiah to come and establish his kingdom. Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 12 that we're looking for the hastening of the coming of the day of the Lord. And the early church, that's all they waited for. Paul the Apostle, he said over and over, we who are alive and remain when Jesus comes, that's going to be it. We're going to enter into the kingdom. This was just 30, 40, 50 years after Jesus had ascended. They were hoping that he would come back and do what they asked in Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And so the belief of the New Testament writers and the Old Testament prophets and believers was that the kingdom of God would be established on the earth. And that was the predominant theme of the church until the fourth century. Now, by way of correction, we need to address some other views that came into the church in the fourth century. See, because what the Bible teaches is that Jesus Christ will come back pre the millennial reign, pre-kingdom. It's called the pre-millennial view. How many of you have studied any of this? There's a couple of hands. There are three different views about the millennium, the kingdom. Look over at Revelation chapter 20. Somebody might say, well, why do you say that there's going to be a thousand year reign? Why do you believe that? And the answer is because the Bible teaches it. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit. And he had a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years. Won't that be the day when Satan is bound, no longer to tempt, no longer to hurt, no longer to maim. The Bible says that he desires to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Well, he will be bound a thousand years. And it says in verse three, he cast him into a bottomless pit and shut him up. And he set a seal over him so that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. And so 
in that period of Christ's reign for a thousand years, Satan will be bound. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. John says in verse 4, I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Many people will be killed by the Antichrist, but they will be resurrected to rule and reign with Jesus Christ for that thousand year reign. Verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead did not live again or weren't resurrected until the thousand years were finished. And so the first resurrection begins at the beginning of that thousand year reign. Verse 6, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they'll be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and he will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. And it goes on. And so you and I who will be here at the revelation and the return of Jesus Christ will be raptured, resurrected at the same time in the twinkling of an eye as we studied two weeks ago. We will rule and reign with Jesus Christ on the earth. And here it says six times in Revelation chapter 20 that it will be for a thousand years. But something happened in around the fourth century. Most of the church prior to this for 400 years believed that Jesus Christ would come again and the kingdom would be restored to Israel. And yet a couple of things happened. Two new views came into vogue, post-millennialism and amillennialism. Now, just very briefly, because you're going to run into a lot of people with different views, I want to explain these to you. Postmillennialism says that Jesus Christ will come back after the millennial reign, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it will be a thousand years. They believe that the church will be endued with a new power, and they'll bring in the kingdom of God, and that the earth will exist with this sort of magnificent dominant church for a period of time, and then Jesus Christ will come back post-millennium. And then there's another view called awe-millennialism. Awe means without or not. And what that view says is that, well, the millennium doesn't mean millennium. Thousand years doesn't mean a thousand years. It just means any amount of time or the fullness of time. That the kingdom of God is here now and it's existed for 2,000 years and that Jesus Christ will come back any time and there will be no millennium after that. But this is it. This is as good as it gets. Satan is bound now. The church is ruling and reigning now. Things are getting better and better and better. And pretty soon Jesus Christ will come in and we'll sum it all up. How did this happen? How did this view come in? Well, a couple of things happened around 312. You know, the church suffered persecution, radical persecution for about 180 years. After the church was born and the people that waited for the Holy Spirit were filled and they went out into the earth, the different emperors began to persecute the Christians. Christians were killed by the thousands in the arenas where the sand soaked up their blood and lions were fed with the blood of Christians. They persecuted them for 180 years through consecutive emperor after emperor. But then something happened in 312. Constantine, the emperor of Rome at the time, as he went out to battle, he says that he had an epiphany. He saw in the sky the sign of a cross, probably shaped by the clouds. And he says that he heard a voice that said, in this sign conquer. And so he said, all right, all you Christians, it's time to join together. And basically, he Christianized the Roman Empire with what was known as the Edict of Toleration. Basically, what he said is Christianity is no longer outlawed. We, we won't persecute you anymore. Let's just call everything Christian. It was sort of the marriage of church and state. The Roman Empire became the Holy Roman Empire, although it wasn't holy, holy. It was rather pagan. It wasn't so much a conversion as it was a labeling because they had all kinds of pagan practices and all of a sudden they just stamped onto it Christian. Everything that was done in pagan rituals was now called Christian. And that's the way Rome existed. Christianity became sort of a state religion. And it existed for about a 100 years before the Visigoths came in in 410 and they sacked Rome. If you know your history, you realize that the Visigoths came in in 407. They paid them tribute, but they withheld some of the money. So they came back in 410 and they pretty much ransacked the city. The people in Rome were so upset, they said, oh, we know why it is. It's because we've forsaken our pagan gods and we've embraced Christianity. 
And so around this time, something else was happening. Gnosticism was thriving in the area of Alexandria. Gnosticism was that cult that said, well, everything physical is bad. Physical equals carnal. Material is bad. Immaterial is good. Spiritual is good. And there was sort of this dichotomy between matter and non-matter. And what happened was that many people were being influenced by this and they were writing Gnostic Gospels and it was a real heresy that the church had to deal with. But at the same time, an incredible thinker from Hippo, Augustine, he wrote a, a book called City of God. And in this book, what he wanted to counter was the seeming marriage between the church and the state. And so basically in his book, he said, well, there are two cities. There's the city of God and the city of the world. And the city of God is not a material city. That is, you know, Rome is not the head of the church. And he did a really good work with it as well. The problem was that he was influenced by a man by the name of Tychonius of Africa. Tychonius had written a commentary on Revelation because he was influenced by this Gnostic thinking. He said, no, no, none of this is physical because a physical kingdom that comes to earth is carnal and carnal things are bad. So it must therefore be spiritual. And he went through the book of Revelation and he said, all of these are things are spiritual. There is no kingdom of God that's coming to the earth. And so Augustine, when he read Revelation chapter 20, and he came to a thousand years, he took that number and he said, you know, this is interesting. It's a beautiful number. It's 10 times 10 times 10, 10 to the third power. It must not literally be a thousand years. It must be a spiritual number. Actually, the first thing he said was that we are in the kingdom of God. It's a spiritual kingdom. We are the city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. He actually believed that Jesus Christ would come back in the year 1000. But at the same time, he said, we can't be totally sure that 1,000 means 1,000 in the Bible. It must be spiritual. And so when the year 1,000 came to pass, Jesus Christ didn't come back again. They said, well, it just must be a non-number. And so amillennialism was birthed. Postmillennialism and amillennialism was created by one of the, the greatest minds of Christian thinking, Augustine. The problem is it's completely false. And so the idea that persists to this day is that the kingdom of God is not physical. It's not real. Jesus Christ is not coming back again. After the year 1000 and when the reformers broke away from the Roman Catholic Church, one thing they kept was the theology or the eschatology of Constantine. The early church fathers had not believed it. The writers of the New Testament had not believed it. The hope of the prophets and the saints in the Old Testament hadn't believed it. They believed that Jesus Christ or the Messiah would come back and establish his kingdom. But these other views persisted, and I think you have to be more flexible than a Romanian gymnast to try to fit in some of these scriptures because they are twisted and they are warped. Basically, it says none of the stuff written in the Old Testament matters to the Jews. The Jews don't exist. And here's one thing. If you're going to get eschatology right, the study of last things, you've got to get the Jews right. At any rate, the reformers held to amillennialism and postmillennialism. Calvin even said that premillennialism was intolerable blasphemy and that it was too childish to even refute. And so in the modern days, the millennium is discounted. But let's just go back to see what the Bible says. The Bible says that Jesus Christ will come again and he will establish his kingdom. The Bible says that the God of the Bible is the God of Israel over 200 times. It speaks of Israel over 2,000 times. Actually, a great scholar, John Stott, was asked recently at a conference, what significance does Israel have today? And he said, Israel has no significance at all. That's pretty strange, isn't it? The Bible's all about Israel. Genesis started with Israel. And Revelation ends with Israel. 70% of the Bible is about Israel. But once you get Israel wrong, you get major problems. I'm going to say something that only a few of you will understand. And those who understand it will be offended by it. The tree of amillennialism has its root in Gnosticism, its fruit in preterism, which bears the seed of anti-Semitism. And it will end up in hell. Let's move on. With that said, what is the hope for Christians? 
The hope is this, that Jesus Christ will come again and he'll establish his kingdom. You and I may be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. This earth will be completely transformed by the presence of Jesus Christ, and we will rule and reign. Some of you may choose to live in the land of Israel. You may choose to live close to Jerusalem. You may choose to live in the newly renovated deserts of Saudi Arabia. I don't know exactly what it's going to be like, but the Bible says the whole surface of the earth will be changed. Who will be there? Well, you and I will be there. But there will be many people that have survived the tribulation. Remember, there would be 144,000 Jews that actually survived. And if you take 1% of the current population, if that amount survives into the tribulation, that's 66 million people. One-tenth of 1% is is 6.6 million people. What will happen? The Bible says there in Isaiah chapter 65, let's turn there, death will be rare as a matter of fact. Isaiah 65 verse 20 says this, no more shall an infant from there live but a few days. Many of you have experienced a miscarriage or a child passing away. But the Bible says here that won't happen anymore. Some cultures, they celebrate the first birthday, don't they? Because a child survives the first year, that's a major step. But it says here in Isaiah 65, verse 20, No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old. Oh, what a tragedy. He was so young, 107 years old. Just a child at 100 years old. And it says the sinner being 100 years old will be accursed. They shall build houses, they will inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Verse 22 says, they shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree, so shall the days of my people. The days of a tree. How long does a tree live? Well, there's some trees that are about a thousand years old, aren't there? We read in the book of Genesis that certain people lived close to a thousand years old. So when Jesus Christ comes back, something is going to happen to even those who are mortal on the earth. They will be restored to have incredibly long lifespans. Children won't die. Sickness will be dealt with and taken care of. And so people will live. There will be no birth control either. And so what's going to happen with those survivors is they are going to repopulate the planet really quickly. It says they will not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble. They shall be descendants of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf shall dwell. Or I'm sorry, verse 25 says, The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the dust shall be the serpent's food. Remember what Satan was told by Jesus. On your belly you shall go. The dust will be your food. And so what happens is sin is actually dealt with completely. Satan is bound. The serpent eats dust. In other words, the curse comes fully on the devil. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. And so sickness is cured. Death is rare. We'll go back to what looks like the pre-flood conditions and the earth will be repopulated. Now, the Bible says at the end of this thousand years, Satan is released. And to show, I think, the foolishness of mankind, some people will actually rebel against Jesus Christ. We will live in this time in our spiritual bodies, sort of as the administrators of Jesus Christ. We'll have a certain district. I don't know exactly what it's going to be like, but the Bible says we will rule and reign with Christ. I want to have Maui and Kauai or maybe the South Pacific somewhere. I don't know exactly. Although those islands are going to be wiped out from the tribulation, so I'm not sure exactly. Maybe a place with surf. Because in the new heavens, in the new earth, the Bible says there will be no sea. And so you better do your surfing now while you can. (laughs) But at the end of this beautiful, beautiful time of paradise, it says the devil will be released and people will actually rebel against God once again. And then the end will come. The Bible says that we will enter into the eternal state. Jesus Christ will make a new heavens and a new earth. The question is asked as we close, well, why then would he establish a kingdom on the earth for a thousand years? I think there's two reasons. The first reason is he just wants to show how to do it. 
He just wants to show how it's done, how to rule and reign on the earth with peace. You know, in front of the UN building in New York City, they actually have a statue, uh, uh, an image that was donated by the Russians, by the Soviets in 1959. It's, it's a huge bronze statue of this muscular man hammering a sword into a plowshare. And there they quote the book of Isaiah, chapter 2, verse 4. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and they will learn war no more. It's found in Joel chapter 3, verse 10, and Micah chapter 4, verse 3. And yet what they do in front of the United Nations building is they leave out the part that refers to God. And so mankind will seek peace without the Prince of Peace. And for all these years, the only thing that he can do is kill each other. Now they say that if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And mankind has only known how to rule by war. We spend trillions on weapons to destroy other people. Some of the best technology in the world comes from war games, comes from deciding how we can kill others. And the amount of money that's spent by mankind in order to create peace is astronomical. And that money is spent on how to dominate others. Well, Jesus Christ will come again. And the Prince of Peace will show how it's really done. The funny thing about that statue in front of the UN is that it was given by the Soviets in 1959. And it says, we shall beat our swords into plowshares. Did the Soviets beat their swords into plowshares from 1959 to 1999 or 1989? No way. It was 30 years of building nuclear bombs to kill one another. But the Prince of Peace will come again. We've tried for peace, but we've left only pieces. Jesus will come and he'll pick up the pieces. My dad and I, we laid some concrete the other day, and we needed to use some duct tape. He asked me if I had any duct tape. I didn't have any. What a shame. How embarrassing. So my dad brought down this roll of duct tape, and I couldn't believe the size of it. Have you noticed that duct tape is growing in size? It used to be you could just get a roll. Now it's like this giant wheel of duct tape. And as I saw it, I have to confess to you that I began to salivate. Because you can fix anything with duct tape. If you had enough duct tape, you could rule the world. Right? I think I like duct tape and zip ties, their friendly cousin. Because you can fix just about anything with them. And that's the way I fix things. I patch them. And that's not the way Jesus fixes them. He repairs them. How many times have I approached life with my duct tape approach saying, I'm going to fix this thing by just wrapping it up. I'm going to cover it up. I've got a hole in my shoe. I'll wrap duct tape around it, which I've done actually. But how we do that in our lives, Jesus Christ will come again and he won't patch anything. He will restore it. He will renew it. He won't paint over the rust. He'll replace the panel. He'll completely redo the earth. But think of that. You can actually experience that in your life now. Jesus doesn't come and tape up your marriage. He repairs it. He restores it. He doesn't just put a little bondo on the heartbreak of your life. He actually replaces it. We love to repair things, but Jesus Christ absolutely replaces things. The Bible says that if any person is in Christ, they're a new creation. I was speaking to a woman the other day who was confessing to me about her marriage over the phone. And and I told her, well, you know, the amazing thing about life is that when Jesus Christ comes into your heart, he makes you a new person. And that new person is what you bring into a relationship. And it takes a little time at first for that other one to realize it. When my father got saved, he and my mother had destroyed each other's lives for years. And my dad came home and he says, I accepted Jesus Christ into my heart. She looked at him with that strange look. And then he started reading the Bible and his life began to change. And she said, okay, this is all right. I like this Jesus work in your life. And then she said to him, but the day you become a a pastor, I'm leaving you. And my dad became a pastor, but she didn't leave. See, what happened is Jesus was introduced into their relationship. And that's what happens in your life. You've been wounded. Oh, you carry so much baggage from your upbringing, from the way you see the world through the filter of your weaknesses or the struggles of your life. And Jesus Christ comes in and he says, you know what, I'm going to make all things new. And he restores you. 
He heals you. How many of you can testify to the fact that Jesus Christ came in and he didn't patch up your life with duct tape, but he completely renewed you? He took what was broken, he took what was eaten, he took what was wasted, and he completely renewed it. He did it in my life and he did it in your life. And if you're a person who's sitting there today thinking, well, what is this all about? Let me tell you, if you open your heart to Jesus Christ, he'll come in and he will repair everything that's gone wrong. He will completely restore you. And that's the very same thing he's going to do when he comes again. The other reason I think Jesus is going to rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years is because at the end of it, he's going to allow mankind the choice once again. And Satan will be released. And believe it or not, with all the blessings that people have experienced, they will still turn away and follow after Satan. Isn't that a bizarre thing? Isn't that weird? How when righteousness and the choice before us is there, sometimes people will choose the darkness. But that choice is yours. The Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But you know, only those who do it voluntarily will be saved. And the choice may be yours then. And it may be yours now. And it is yours. Jesus said, all who will come to me, come. And I will in no wise cast out. And so the end isn't near. The beginning is near. The Bible says that if any person is in Christ Jesus, they are a new creation. The choice is yours this morning. You can be made new simply by saying, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please come into my life. Forgive me of my sin and you will be renewed. You will be restored. You will be repaired. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are alive, that you are a living God and that you've saved us from serving the things of this world. We pray that this morning you would bless us with a deep knowledge and understanding of who you are, that you would strengthen us to hope in your kingdom. We know, Lord Jesus, that you're coming again. And so we pray that you would prepare our hearts, that you would prepare the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.